There's a very short list of things so awful, so terrible, so catastrophically damaging to Earth, history, and culture that they're often used as the baseline for comparison for the most dreadful, foulest atrocities ever to blight the planet, like Hitler. Whenever you talk about someone being oppressive or brutal, you compare them to the worst dictator ever, or Nazis or something. And when you're talking about a bad movie, a bad story, bad anything, well, it's almost always compared to the cinematic holocaust known as Highlander 2 The Quickening. Everyone's at least heard about this movie, they know it's like the worst movie ever made. And it's not. I mean, it's definitely up there, but there's been worse movies, maybe like one or two. But the reason this movie is so notorious is because it represents the most complete, utter, and spectacular ruination of a promising cult film phenomenon, to the point that even the mere presence of its poster in my room is a cheap punchline, a testament to artistic incompetence. It raises memories so tainted and raped that even the sight of it has had people wishing me to die in a car fire. And really, I think the main problem is based in the whole premise of the Highlander movie. Highlander's about a small group of people all over the world who are, for reasons unknown to them, immortal, unless their head is cut from their body, which confers the slain immortal's memories and power to the victor. Their only common law is that they're forbidden from fighting on holy ground. One day, they're all drawn to the same place, called the Gathering, and destined to do battle in single combat until only one remains. The Gathering. And that person is granted the prize, which is an unknown power that might spell doom for the world if it were to fall into evil hands. And the tagline, the coda of the whole movie, was, there can be only one. And guess what? Spoiler alert, that's exactly what happens at the end of Highlander. Connor McCloud, the eponymous Highlander, kills the bad guy, claims the prize, and he lives happily ever after. The whole thesis of the movie is that by winning the prize, there is now only one. Not a lot of wiggle room for a sequel, you know what I'm saying? A prequel, maybe, but not a sequel. I mean, everyone's dead. Even Sean Connery, who somehow comes back for this one. I guess all I'm saying is, to pull off a convincing sequel, they'd have to get pretty damn creative. Dan, well, yeah, I guess they do get creative. The movie's set in the post-apocalyptic future. I've already lost you, haven't I? Okay, well, actually, it opens up mid-apocalypse in the not-too-distant future of 1999. And why did they bother to specify that it's August in that subtitle? How the hell does that help? What does incompetent mean? Well, anyway, we hear a long montage of news footage explaining that pollution has ruined the ozone layer, and all the life on Earth is being killed off by the sun's harmful UV radiation. Good morning. Today's top story is the ozone layer. It continues to disintegrate, taking with it our protection from the sun's rays. The and research has shown that the polar ass caps will continue to melt at an accelerating rate unless we all buy a Prius today. Connor McCloud, the hero from the first movie, is now a mortal man after winning the prize, which was basically the ability to access the thoughts and knowledge of every human in existence, and he uses this to team up with the world's greatest scientists and create a giant planetary shield. They'll remember this day for a thousand years. The day we protected the planet from the sun. The horrible life-giving sun! We finally defeated it with science! The shield. 25 years ago, it was our savior. But now, no sun, no stars. It drains the energy from the whole world. We're falling apart. Yeah, McLeod Shield basically trashed the planet. People are a little upset. Oh, sure, in hindsight, it seems obvious that completely blocking out the sun would cause catastrophic global ecological upheaval, usher in an ice age, and, you know, destroy all plant life on Earth. But how are we supposed to know? We're only scientists, not fortune tellers! And I admit this is a minor point, but we can also hear a news report in McLeod's car that says one of the stupidest things I've ever heard in a movie since Bracket is no mad dog killer. Today, the Shield Corporation, the world's largest private company, was accused of monopoly and price fixing. Monopoly and price fixing? Really? You mean to tell me that Connor McLeod's Planetary Shield unfairly put all the other competing Planetary Shield corporations out of business? Of course he has a monopoly! He invented the fucking Planetary Shield! The one shield surrounding the one planet! And price fixing's the one that kills me. What, the Shield Corporation is illegally charging too much for a service everyone needs to have to not burst into flames! What are they gonna do if you don't pay your bill? Turn the shield off? No, you are being ridiculous. 
You're telling me that a single corporation providing a service necessary for every human being on the planet to survive is price gouging billions of people and is not subject to any form of government oversight, subsidy, or control? And why is everyone so eager to buy into the stereotype of the greedy, evil, monolithic corporation just because this is a cyberpunk movie set in a dystopian future? It's not like their CEO is clearly a suspicious, shifty-eyed, weaselly, money-grubbing douchebag. <laughs> Okay, yeah, so this is gonna be a really long movie. So the elderly McLeod goes to opera to watch opera, and so begins one of the most infamous flashbacks in movie history. Remember Highlander. Remember your home. Another galaxy. You were chosen. Remember? Yes. Yes, I remember. The beginning. 500 years ago. On the planet Seist. Oh god, you're serious. On the planet Seist. We planned rebellion. We met in secret, always careful to avoid our deadly enemy, General Katana. See, this is what happens when you write a sequel to a movie without actually watching the first one. So the rebels of Zeist get together to listen to a speech by Sean Connery. Three men of the planet Zeist, hear me. Who still looks stunned he's found a movie worse than Zardoz. I see a man with a great destiny before him. Show him to us. Let him show himself. Let him feel the quickening. Whatever the hell that is, yay! So McCloud is made the leader of the rebellion, despite the fact he doesn't have any experience, doesn't really know anything, doesn't give a shit about Zeist, and spends most of the movie being ordered around by Connery anyway. To make it all official, they dip their fingers in the sacred radioactive orange juice, and, uh, I think they get married. But we are joined in a way that can never be broken. Not even by death. But almost immediately after this, General Katana attacks, ending McCloud's glorious reign of leadership in about eight seconds. Maybe they shouldn't have held their secret rebel meetings in the huge and obvious spaceship wreck in the middle of the desert. Break, break, skip moment. What? Oh, thanks, McLeod! That really turned the tide of this battle! Despite McLeod's patent-like leadership of yelling impotent, ineffectual orders at people who aren't really listening, and couldn't possibly hear them if they were, Katana easily crushes the rebels. I want McLeod and find the one they call Ramirez. Wait, so they're from an alien planet, but they're called Ramirez and McLeod on Zeist too? How does that even work? Like, Ramirez is a Spanish name. I'm not Spanish, I'm Egyptian. Sean Connery's a Scotsman pretending to be an alien, pretending to be an Egyptian, pretending to be a Span... You know what? Fuck it. That's not the point. The point is, the name of the series is Highlander because the protagonist of the series is a native of the Scottish Highlands. He's not a fucking alien! I'm Colin McLeod of the Clan McLeod. Oh, of the Zeist McLeods? What the fuck is this? The entire first movie was spent outlining his origin as a mortal man living in the highlands of fucking Scotland with his family, the McLeod clan. I was banished from the planet Zeist 500 years ago. Scotland! Highlander! Did they think we wouldn't remember the Scotland part? It's the fucking title! You didn't even need to see the movie to get this part right. You might as well have just called it Zeistlander. Kill them. I want all their heads. Oh, and I'd forgotten about General Katana, the Zeistian name if ever I'd heard one. Named after a Japanese sword, because, you know, in this movie people fight with swords. So naturally you figure the guy's a really good sword fighter. And yet, he doesn't carry a katana, which is a little confusing. See, I think maybe as a kid he got teased a lot like I did, like all the time as a kid I heard a, Hey Noah, where's the Ark? Uh, maybe they were like, Hey Katana, where's your Katana dude? <laughs> and he's like, Not everyone named Katana has a Katana guy's god. Oh, and, and by the way, just because I do actually happen to have an Ark in the backyard, it has nothing to do with the fact that my name is Noah. And when the polar ice caps finally melt, flood the earth, and destroy all life, I am not going to let any of you dickweeds who made fun of me in. Now that the rebellion's been crushed, Katana puts McLeod and Ramirez on trial for their crimes and finds them guilty. You've been found guilty of treason. We hereby sentence you to exile from Zeist. You will be sent to the planet Earth. Oh. Okay. Uh, thanks? Once there, you will be immortal. Uh, why? You can only die if your head is cut from your body. Does anyone know what he's talking about? 
When one of you becomes the last of us on Earth, priests, he will claim the prize. He can return to Zeist, or choose to grow old and die on Earth. Oh good, yeah, I'll get right on that. Oh, Lord knows I can't wait to return to this. Why doesn't Katana just kill them? The fuck is stopping him? Instead he makes his enemies immortal? Ha <laughs> ha! This will show McLeod. Have fun knowing that you'll be alive long after I'm dead, bastard. <laughs> None of this makes any sense! Why is Zeiss never mentioned a single time by anyone in the first movie? Why doesn't McLeod recognize Ramirez at all when they meet in Scotland, even though they got married on Zeist? Who are you? Why does Ramirez have to explain everything about immortality to McLeod when he was listening when sentence was passed on Zeist? Why do the other immortals want to fight anyway if the prize sucks so bad? It's better to burn out than to fade away! Why are there other immortals if Katana only sent McLeod and Ramirez to Earth, and he specifically ordered his men to kill all the other rebels? Kill them. Where did they come from? Why are they immortal on Earth and not on Zeist? What the fuck is the quickening? What's the deal with the glowing orange juice? What the fuck is he riding on McLeod's head? What's the significance of the gathering? Why can they telepathically sense deer? And why is this never mentioned again? Why does McLeod have no idea how to fight even though he's an intergalactic freedom fighter? Why does this make even less sense than naked zombie Sean Connery throwing axes at a floating zombie head? Why am I in a Starfleet uniform? How far into this movie are we anyway? When you need me. You'll only have to call my name. Twelve minutes?! How do you completely buttfuck an entire series in twelve minutes?! We're barely out of the opening credits! You have the manners of a goat. I'll cut back to the present, future, whatever, and we see a horrible composite shot of the S.H.I.E.L.D. facility, which doesn't even try to blend in with the landscape or horizon. A team of commandos infiltrates the facility and accesses their computers to find out that the radiation levels above the shield are normal. See? Normal. In huge blinking green letters. And just a small tip for their leader, Louise, you might find it easier to get away with your terrorist attacks if you don't take off your ninja mask in a facility full of security cameras and have people refer to you by your real name. Come on, Louise, let's do it. McCloud is at bar having drink when Louise tracks him down and starts asking him about the shield. She gets in his car and, whoa, <laughs> suddenly the lighting is radically different. The numbers and figures I saw didn't add up. Which numbers? You mean th this one? Oh, good thing you're here to interpret this complex fucking data, Louise. And holy crap! The car passed into a time warp at two hours earlier! Oh, it's the planet Zeist. Yeah, I, I thought this was the planet Cyclo. You can see why I'd be confused. Anyway, General Katana's bored, so he gets these two porcupine-looking jagoffs together for a mission. You leave for the planet Earth immediately. Find McCloud and kill him. But I thought you said McCloud was mortal and can never return. Find him for me. Kill him. Wait, why'd you hit him? Dumbass there just pointed out one of the biggest plot holes in the whole fucking movie. Yeah, this guy figured out one of the plot holes. And Katana doesn't even have an answer for the guy. Why would you write a line of dialogue whose sole purpose is to undermine the urgency of the entire plot? It's so hard to get good help. <laughs> oh, so the Insano family comes from the planet Zeist. That actually explains a lot. The Insano brothers teleport to Earth, giving McCloud a sudden PMS cramp, and he stops the car just as they attack. The cloud. Ladies and gentlemen, the conquerors of Zeist! Seriously, how bad does your rebellion suck if you lose to these guys? The cloud. Get in there! Don't make a sound! In here? Hey, that's a pretty good idea, but maybe you ought to try hiding her someplace when the maniacs aren't looking directly at you. McCloud! Damn! The 70-year-old man with a bad hip jogging slowly away without any form of cover is impossible to hit! Okay, so why didn't the goons just shoot the car and kill McCloud while he was still in it? They had to do their little kung fu dance first? This movie could be over already! Instead, these two clowns are completely unable to subdue a septuagenarian with a pipe, even though they have armor, guns, and swords. McCloud somehow outfights the first guy and rolls him under a trolley, which squishes his head off, and whenever that happens, things explode, because aliens explode when you kill them. They explode a lot. And for some reason, the rejuvenating power of the magic lightning allows him and his clothing to withstand a direct hit to the face by an exploding fuel tanker with lips painted on it.
come on! Even Bugs Bunny would have to sit down for a minute after a shot like that. Oh, and he's young again, because the quickening does that. Huh? So the gun can utterly destroy a police car, but only mildly annoys McCloud. Oh, and they have jetpacks too, did I mention that? McCloud jumps on the other guy's hoverboard, somehow mastering it in seconds. Change! You got changed! Oh god! Come on, help the guy out! My McCloud tries to hook this guy up with some free cable, and well, he blows a fuse. Did General Katana really think this was going to work? Why did he hire these two assholes? And remember, this was plan A. I'd hate to see the fucking B squad. I guess if you want something done. Isn't Katana a general, implying that he has command of, you know, an army? Or were those two guys it? And if he sent McCloud to Earth 500 years ago to be immortal, why is Katana on Zeist exactly the same age 500 years later? You are made of stupid! Now that McCloud's young again, Luis immediately jumps his bones! And yeah, not only is this really gross, I'm officially calling slut on this one. They've known each other a grand total of three minutes! Oh, but I forgot something. Yeah, the bullshit's piling up so fast, I need a bigger shovel. During the boomgasm, McCloud calls out Ramirez's name. Ramirez! And this, for reasons that will forever baffle me, causes him to appear in Scotland on the stage of Hamlet. This is naturally confusing to all involved, since Ramirez was pretty decisively fucked up beyond repair and made to be considerably shorter in the first movie, and this power is never used or mentioned ever again. Here hung those lips that I have kissed I know not how oft. Sir, whatever you gentlemen felt for each other when your friend was still alive is certainly none of my affair. <laughs> What's your fucking game, shithead? <laughs> shithead? What's a shithead? Look this movie up on IMDb, I'll show you about a hundred of them. <laughs> Meanwhile, General Katana teleports to Earth, crashing into a subway train. I guess teleporting is a suicidal, insane way to travel that will slam you into the ground at 300 miles an hour. <laughs> this sure doesn't look like Kansas, does it? Kansas? How the fuck does he know? Do they have the Wizard of Oz on Zeist? Can you actually picture General Katana sitting on a couch watching The Wizard of Oz? Now die! <laughs> yes! That's what I need to defeat McCloud. Flying monkeys! You two, over here! I have a plan. Katana seizes control of the subway train because... Uh... Oh, well, we need to rip off that scene from the first movie where the Kurgan drives around terrorizing McCloud's girlfriend. Apparently that part from the first movie they remembered. Anyway, I guess in the future subway cars will be able to go 400 miles per hour. Remember folks, at any time your subway conductor could lose his fucking mind and make the train go so fast it'll cover the train in lightning and somehow propel you and everything inside backwards at lethal velocity. Last stop. Somehow Katana knows exactly where McCloud is and starts taunting him as he's paying his respects to... somebody. Ashes to ashes. Dust to dust. If you don't take it out and use it, it's going to rust. I'm talking about my penis. Aren't I? Remember the golden rule, Highlander. We must never fight on holy ground. And this is holy ground. What does he care? In the first movie, the superstition against fighting on holy ground actually made sense when we didn't know the origin of the mysterious immortality. But now we know it's all just aliens, and why should they care about Earth religions? You're not coming back to Zeiss, McLeod. I never planned to. Someone actually got paid to write this. What do you mean? After all this time, I was ready to kick back, crawl, and die. Then you send those punks down here. You changed everything. And now I'm back to square one. Immortal. Again. Oh, General Katana is a fucking idiot. Of course McCloud's not gonna go back to Zeist. Who the fuck would want to go back to that shithole alone with all his enemies waiting there for him? 
Even if he was going back, he would have gone back immediately after winning the prize and he could still fight, not 40 years later as an old man. And even if he did do that, you could easily just kill him. He's the one guy you easily defeated the first time you fought. Even Nimrod here figured this out, and you hit him in the face for it. We wouldn't even have a movie if you just stayed at home, played some Nintendo, and let the poor bastard drink himself to death in two years. But no! You had to go to Earth and shake his fucking tree. Now you done pissed him off, and yeah, now he wants to kill you. Exiling the guy from Zeist was the nicest thing he could have done for the guy, and literally the only reason he wants to kill you now is you fucked up his retirement. This fucking movie is... Highlander 2 The Quickening is the smartest sci-fi thriller since Blade Runner.